Uh, thank you so much. This is, a, this is amazing, actually. Um, this group was started in November of 2013 with four people. Uh, and this week we just passed 300 members, uh, which is amazing. Uh, because it, originally the Bitcoin meetup itself didn't have 300 members. And now the developer meetup has 300 members. And we keep growing. Uh, by the way, uh, if you didn't hear about it, uh, this week we also had the Bitcoin Jobs Fair in Sunnyvale which was attended by more than 300 people and at least a dozen people got jobs in the crypto space because of it. Uh, I'm going to be hiring three people just out of that one uh, event and I know you hired four people at BitPay. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's not the same people you're going after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's a very successful event and there's probably going to be another one. I would like to arrange another one in about three months. Um, there are jobs in this space and if you develop your skills, uh, transition your skills from other areas of IT or software development or operations, QA, testing, uh, whatever it may be, uh, we can use more and more developers every single day. All right, questions? Um, you know, uh, BITS, if you haven't heard this, this is the idea to transition the unit of uh, accounting, the default unit of accounting for Bitcoins to a smaller unit. Uh, I've been a huge proponent. Last year in uh, June, we tried to do the, uh, uh, to transition to millis across the board. A couple of companies did that, most did not. Um, I do all of my work in millibits just by default because I find it easier. Uh, there's a proposal right now that's being discussed in all of the forums and on Bitcoin Talk to transition the unit of, of uh, default accounting to uh, one millionth of a Bitcoin, a micro bit, uh, spelled with a Greek letter mu or mi as we call it in Greek. Um, so MBTC, uh, and that's uh, micro bits, one millionth of a Bitcoin, or approximately a hundred satoshis, or in fact, exactly. Hundreds of those, <laughs> approximately a hundred satoshis, and the suggestion is to call that bits, to call those bits. Um, I love the unit. I hate the name. I think the name will cause confusion. I'm just waiting for the first person who says, "I managed to buy two bits for just three hundred dollars each," <laughs> um, and then realize they didn't buy bitcoins, but they bought bits instead. Um, so that's not necessarily a very good name, but the idea of reducing the units uh, of default accounting is critical. Um, human psychology. People don't think in 0 0.001 for a coffee. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to anyone. Uh, my rule of thumb is whatever unit of accounting you use, uh, it should cost between one and a hundred of those units to buy a cup of coffee or a cheap meal in, uh, in most currencies. Right? So that should be the rule of thumb. And if it takes zero point something to buy a meal, then you've got the wrong unit. And if it takes ten thousand of something to buy a meal, then you're, you've got Italian lira or Zimbabwe dollars, and that doesn't work either. So um, I like the idea, but I, I hate the name. I expect uh, a lot of the companies are going to be transitioning to that pretty soon. Uh, one of the things that has become clear is that when people hear that Bitcoin is $400, those who don't understand how Bitcoin works, the, they assume that in order to buy Bitcoin, you have to buy a whole Bitcoin. And that means that people think Bitcoin is expensive and they cannot afford it, uh, which is a very damaging misconception. Um, so if people think, well, I need $400 to buy a Bitcoin, nowadays, that puts Bitcoin out of the reach of 90% of the population, because people don't have that kind of cash to spare. Uh, hell, I don't have that kind of cash to spare. So, um, it's important to explain to people, you can buy as little as $10 worth of uh, Bitcoin. But what we've seen is, because of that bias, uh, people buy cheaper currencies. Uh, so, they buy currencies of, of which they can buy uh, thousands of units, for a few dollars, like Doge or other currencies. So I think it's led to um, essentially spilling over inflation into the altcoins uh, because people think those are more affordable. In fact, what you'll see is whenever the Bitcoin price spikes, it, it leaks into the altcoins and drives their price up, 
and then they come back into Bitcoin as the Bitcoin price drops. Um, I'm not worried because uh, altcoins support Bitcoin. Um, they're not competitive. No altcoin is competing against Bitcoin. That's the wrong way to look at it. Every single altcoin is backed by Bitcoin because that's what you use to buy them. Uh, I think of all of the altcoins, only Litecoin and maybe in a couple of exchanges, Doge are actually tradable directly for fiat currencies like dollars and euros. The vast majority of altcoins out there can only be purchased for Bitcoin. So every time someone buys an altcoin, they first have to buy Bitcoin to get it. Uh, or trade something else. So, in fact, uh, altcoin sales uh, support the Bitcoin price and uh, certainly don't concern me. I think we're going to live in a world with tens of thousands of altcoins, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Um, all right, that's that's a great question. Security models. Um, uh, Bitcoin security is still in its infancy. It's it's very hard to secure your money. With Bitcoin and to do it properly. Um, I've explained many times that I keep 99.99% of all of my Bitcoin on paper wallets, uh, encrypted BIP38 paper wallets distributed on a couple of different continents uh, among my relatives. And I do that because I don't trust my computer. I have uh, more than 20 years of experience in information security. And I think that my laptop is compromised at all times. I assume my laptop is compromised at all times. If I wanted to figure out if my laptop is compromised, I could spend uh, about three weeks doing a file-by-file -file forensic analysis in order to prove that my laptop is not compromised. I would then prove that my laptop is not compromised, <laughs> plug it into the internet, and have to start all over again. Uh, you cannot secure a general-purpose operating system whether it's against state-level adversaries who can most easily get in with a variety of means, or just uh, general hackers, trojans, keyloggers, backdoors, etc., etc. So I assume that uh, my laptop, whenever it is on, sometimes when it's not even on, the microphone is recording, the video camera is on, and watching me at all times. I have a sticker over it. Uh, I assume that all of my files are under surveillance. And don't laugh. Uh, on my laptop specifically, because of the prop, because of the target I make in the Bitcoin environment, there's probably a fight going on between three or four different national intelligence agencies for who's going to look at my files first. Um, uh, but you should assume that uh, all of your machines are compromised, most likely compromised by um, just hackers out to get you, and they're looking for specific file patterns. Uh, they're looking for specific string patterns. If you put something in your clipboard that starts with a five, you can assume that the money in that address is going away. Right? Oh, um, say so that again. Uh, if you put a private key, something that starts with a five, in your clipboard to copy paste it from one place to another, you should assume that that money is going to disappear before you have a chance to paste it. Uh, if I was writing Trojans, that's what I'd be looking for. Right? Most electronically and computer-backed banking systems use uh, uh, pull methodologies and multiple levels of recourse, where you can basically refund the money and track it from place to place. The whole point about Bitcoin is because you cannot reverse a transaction once it's happened, and uh, you can't track where it went, uh, it is the world's best internet money. That makes it also the world's most stealable internet money. And it will fuel a lot of uh, a lot of theft because if you're a hacker now, that's what you're after. Uh, it's the easiest target to go after. Why try to monetize spam or CPU if you can steal Bitcoin directly? So, pretty much every virus writer on the planet at the moment is targeting Bitcoin wallets. And so, what does that mean? How do you manage security in a Bitcoin world? Uh, it's going to be a big problem. We, as I like to say, we have four and a half million years of experience doing physical security. From, from the moment a caveman hit a squirrel under a rock so the other caveman wouldn't eat it, uh, we had physical security experience. Now that, that caveman learned the trick from the squirrel. He was hiding nuts for four and a half billion years. That's a whole other story. Uh, we have 50 years of experience doing information security and we, we suck at it. We completely suck at it. We can't basic secure a basic operating system. Uh, no one can. Um, not even the most sophisticated 
information and security experts in the world can secure a general purpose operating system that is connected to the internet. You cannot do it. So what is the answer? Offline systems, hardware wallets, and uh, uh, systems that can be booted into trusted operating systems. Uh, what that means is that if I want to do Bitcoin transactions off my paper wallets, I boot a machine that I keep, a separate laptop that I keep offline at all times. I boot it into a trusted Linux operating system from a CD-ROM. Um, I do transactions on that machine onto a printer or off a QR code off paper. I sign transactions, put them on a USB stick, turn the computer off, and then I publish that transaction. It never touches the internet. Uh, that's the, and that's the only place I generate keys. That's the only place I generate paper wallets, and that's the only way I can maintain security of my systems. Um, because I can't do information security, I convert it to physical security. When I print out a paper wallet, what I'm doing is I'm taking something from the realm of information security and I'm moving it into the realm of physical security. Because I can take that paper wallet and I can put it in a steel box with a key. Uh, and then apply all of the experience of, of physical security to securing that token. Uh, in fact, ironically, I use a bank safety deposit box to store my Bitcoin paper wallets. Uh, because banks suck most things, but they know how to build steel boxes and put armed people outside them. Um, yes. I've uh, compiled a custom version of Tails with Armory, Electrum, um, Lux, TrueCrypt, uh, and a whole bunch of other tools that I need to uh, process encrypted volumes, to process keys, to process transactions. And I boot into Tails for all of my Bitcoin transactions. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. This is my portable operating system. My carrier with me. It's, uh, it's just a resilient, steel case, waterproof. USB stick, bought it for like 60 bucks, 8 gig. This does not have any keys on it, so don't look at me. And <laughs> <laughs> I do not store any keys on digital media. What this has is the, is the software I need to boot an operating system, uh, boot a computer into a trusted operating system so I can do transactions. So this has a copy of Tails with Armory and Electrum on it, and I use this to sign transactions to reconstitute private keys from shared secrets, from multi-share secrets, uh, and to do things like that. A, a Linux virtual machine is better than a Mac operating system, which is better than Windows XP, but it's much more vulnerable than booting from BIOS. Much, much more vulnerable. It is relatively easy to write software that sits in the host operating system and that can inspect the memory, the clipboard, uh, even the screen into screenshots and will look for a QR code or a string that starts with five like a private key and when you expose that to the underlying virtual operating system will steal it from you. Uh, so vir uh, virtualized operating systems can be useful. They're certainly better than the underlying OS, but they're not foolproof. You're just again you're just dealing with more sophisticated attackers. The best approach is to do things offline uh, to print out over a USB cable, not a wireless printer, to a dumb printer that doesn't have memory or firmware, and to boot into a completely blank operating system. Even this is not ideal, because this is read-write media. So it's my job to never plug this in to a computer that's on. Turn it off, plug it in, boot it into this clean operating system. If I plug it into a computer that's on, and it can write to this USB stick, it's compromised. I have to rebuild it from sources. Um, so, even better, CD-ROM. Uh, they cannot be modified. So, that's just basic uh, uh, information security practices. Now, if you think that mainstream users are going to do this, uh, we're crazy. I mean, we have a big problem in this space. How do we solve that? Yeah. Yeah. So